This is Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. Returning directly to Oliver McGee, author of the book Jumping the Isle, How I Became a Black Republican in the Age of Obama. Did then all of that concern for what happens in the inner city, the cultural degradation, I might have added the violence here in Chicago uh, every weekend of black young men, uh, adolescents and even older, are killing one another. Uh, And uh, the only um, interest is whether it will be higher or lower than the toll that was taken on the previous weekend. Uh, what's the way out? And does the Republican Party, uh, in its present incarnation uh, in the campaign of Governor Romney, does it have any significant purchase on these problems? Well, I tell you, if you don't have a job, if you don't have a core family, if you don't have a church to go to, if you're not in school, if you're not involved in financial literacy and reading literacy, writing, listening, and speaking literacy, and if you don't have a charity to give to, and you're looking to the government for a handout or a holdout or an entitlement or an enticement that never comes in the mail because we're all running out of money in the government, then we have to not be surprised with some of those statistics, shocking, as you've just relayed, coming out of the great windy city of Chicago. And out of lots of other American cities as well, of course. Absolutely. So it's about how both candidates are talking about not just one institution, which is the government, but what are both candidates talking about families and churches and schools and businesses and charity in a totality. And I might add, looking straight into the camera and talking to the American people during the debate and laying that future forward. When I wrote this book, Mill, I said, I'm going to talk about how we're respecting history and how the 2008 election might have been a respect towards history. But are we still respecting the history in America in regards to these institutions? But I also want to take a look at hope and change very candidly in the present and say, is this a way that we're being shown? And is that hope and change actually turned into a strip mining of America? That's the question you're raising here this evening. And then I really wanted to take our sights forward and look forward into America on getting to 2076. You know, we're about to go into America's third century. And that's called America's Church Centennial. And in that, I was saying, if we don't pay attention to capital and technology and competition, all of those things which come out of education, capital is financial literacy, technology is uh, understanding uh, the role of science and math and reading, writing, listening, speaking, liberal arts, and getting that education core and solid in our lives. And if we don't do those two pieces together, we're not going to be competitive for America's third centennial. Well, the basic question then becomes the uh, the ancient one. How do you get from here to there? Well, I always say that you got to take a look at history and see where you came from to see where you are and then where you're going. And if I could take just a few moments to talk about history, just for a brief moment, because history is a, is, a, is a fundamental subject that I think requires a perspective. We're coming out of three major industrial revolutions in America. The first industrial revolution gave us railroads and steam engines, and that was from 1750 to 1830. Then we moved into a second revolution of growth, where we had electricity, internal combustion engines, aircraft engines, and propulsion that I designed, uh, running water and indoor toilets and communications and entertainment and chemicals, oil, gas, what I like to call an urbanization and a transportation speed era, moving people, ideas, and things. That was from 1870 to 1900. That was a massive amount of growth for America. And then we got to a third revolution of growth, what I like to call the information age, computers, the the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs, who were excellent in creating uh, products. Steve Jobs were just excellent in creating products. The iSeries is a wonderful product, telling people how 
in how to experience good products. We have the, we got the internet, we've got mobile phones. That was 1960 to the present. In America's Church Centennial, in the book, I'm talking about the fourth revolution of growth. We have to get to the seven grand challenge techs, what I call infotech, biotech, wireless tech, microtech, nanotech, kel, uh, cognotech, brain research, and elder tech. And I'm saying it's going to be about the four R's, revolutionizing like we did in 1776, reorganizing the country like we did in 1876 as the second revolution, reinventing America like we did in 1976 as the bicentennial, so that we can renew America on getting to 2076. Now, some people will say, oh, we got Dr. McGee, he is a futurist. Why is he talking about America's church centennial when we're trying to deal with 2012 and try to decide between Romney 47 and Obama 47? Why is he stretching us all the way out to America's church centennial? I might add the first reference of that subject in the literature. No one is talking about that. Google it. You can Google it. I challenge your listeners to Google America's church centennial and see if you can find anyone using that language. Why are we stretching out there? Because Americans are growing weary of two- and three-year-long political campaigns where the debates on the media on the left and the right on triple screens and quadruple screens were watching people argue back and forth in the noise. We're talking about all kinds of arguments and debates. I had to turn my television off for two years in order to write this book because I had to take myself in a different perspective and say, what are we going to be arguing about? or discussing, or even debating about in, in 2076. But were you able to bring yourself to watch the, the first presidential debate? That's right. We, the presidential debate in 2076 is going to be about... No, I mean, that, were you able to watch the one last week? Yes, it, it, but it's going to be about competition, technology, and capital. Now, you, you, are you asking me about... I, yeah, I mean to ask you, what did you hear in the last debate that, that has bearing upon the concerns that you're expressing so well tonight? What I heard is uh, the President of the United States was speaking about his passion of health. He was looking into the camera twice. The two times he looked straight into the camera, he spoke to the American people about Obamacare and the health of a person who is 54 or 55 years old. And the rest of the time, he was looking down and away and at uh, Jim Lair and all over the place, except in our eyes, when, only when he was talking about our health. So one candidate was talking about our health. The other candidate, Romney, was talking about our growth. He was saying, he was looking at this history that I just gave in the Industrial Revolution and said, we can still produce more products. And when we can produce more products like Steve Jobs was doing for us and producing more techs like the seven techs that I've described, then there is still some sustainable growth that we can do in America and move faster than 2%, and we can get back to the 4% date. We can create more than 114,000 jobs in a period. We can actually produce 220,000 jobs. That's what he's saying. So one is saying jobs and growth are growth, giving us a job and our growth, and the other candidate was debating, here is your health. Now, why is the other, ca- other candidate saying, uh, here is your health? Why is the president saying, pay attention to your health? He's perhaps looking at a much more dangerous world. No. He's probably saying, we're not going to have a run on Wall Street. We're going to have a run on the neighborhood hospital. With the tensions that he may be seeing in the Middle East, um, the tensions you may be seeing uh, going on with Israel and a nuclear-armed Iran, what happens if we have a nuclear event over there? you think that's going to stay over in that region, the, the environmental fallout? It's going to shift over to the winds of America, going on to the shores of New York. He may be warning that. I have no uh, uh, real source of information that this may be on the mind of the president right now. But something was happening for how he had performed in the debate. 
I've got to uh, ask you about uh, your own institution, that is uh, uh, Howard University. You know, years ago, I gave a few lectures there. I had some friends in the sociology department who asked me to come in and talk about some stuff I was doing. Uh, and uh, But what I mean to ask you directly now is about the kids. Uh, and uh, Howard has trained a lot of black professionals over the la- over the last fifty year or or more years who fill the hospitals and the courts and so on um, uh, it 's not the only black uh, institution of higher learning but it 's um, the one that has carried a, a large part of the assignment over these years and the kids are bright and responsive and intelligent. What do you hear from them about their sense? of American politics in relation to the black agenda, if there still is a black agenda? Do they feel there is a black agenda? And if so, uh, do most of them do what you said most uh, American blacks do, namely put their fortunes and their confidence in the Democratic Party rather than in the one that you jumped over to join? Most Howard um, students are on the left. That's what I assume would be the case, right? They are proud to have the first black president. What there is also at Howard, being a diverse university, that there are some who are more conservative and who have uh, some allegiance on the right. No, when you look at black Americans, we are inherently conservative folks. We're, we're, we're fiscally conservative. We have to be in order to maintain uh, very limited incomes mm-hmm. and sometimes stressed incomes. We have to have conservative pocketbooks and wallets. We are conservative in our churches. The black church is a very, very conservative institution. We are conservative in uh, making choices and decisions on how we're going to educate our kids. Uh, we have to be very, very careful about if we're able to choose a school in the public school system. But also, some of us are being very conservative about thinking about looking at school vouchers and having school choice, because not all schools are created equal. And we're also very, very conservative when we're running our businesses, because we have to look at limited choices of capital. Uh, We have very limited black bankers in our major cities that we're hard-pressed to find black banks in major cities. So we have to be very, very conservative about how we create capital. And also we have to be very conservative in how we're looking to train ourselves in science and technology and engineering and mathematics. The White House Council on HBCUs has this as the highest priority amongst the 100 HBCUs that exist in the United States, that's the historically black colleges and universities. And in those historically black colleges and universities, we have to be rather conservative in keeping the books, to keep the doors open through the United Negro College Fund and contributions from the Urban League. And I would also step out there and say, even the NAACP is inherently, fundamentally, a conservative institution because it is trying to be uh, conservative in his movement toward making sure that historical wrongs are corrected, but also looking at the haves and the have-nots, and and not necessarily just be locked in class warfare, but also making some uh, inroads in very conservative institutions called America, which has been centered right historically and will always will be. We're about to pause. A last round of commercials is coming. 